soul and the Tazkiyah kind of topics, which we did cover up a few topics from this book, but in this book, I'll just be briefing you in the beginning today how what, what the topics are in the index and what we will be covering up, inshallah. It's a very short book, so we can you know, complete the whole book, inshallah. So um, in the beginning, there are some sayings of Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah, so inshallah, we will just go through those. And then the first chapter, in chapter one, uh, he speaks about concerning the ailments of the hearts and their cures. So what is a sick heart? What is a sound heart? What is a dead heart? In the Quran being a cure for the heart. How righteous actions are a cure for the heart. How leaving sins are a cure for the heart. Also the effects of sins upon the purity of a heart. And I think we did one entire session. So those who are listening to this recording, uh, if you've missed the session on um, the effects of sins, or I think I think it was the topic of istighfar. There's one series on the YouTube channel which is called the, the title of the YouTube video is istighfar, maybe repentance. So in that, in, I've spoken in the second half about the effects of sins in our lives, the consequences of sins. So he has a few pages on that, and the types of oppression, the state of the dead heart, the need for beneficial knowledge, and the reality of life of the heart. Then in chapter two, he speaks about <clears throat> hasad. The entire chapter is dedicated to hasad. So he speaks about the types of hasad, um, the, there are a few stories about, just something about Umar radiallahu and when, what he had to say about it, then whoever's ranking becomes lofty, he is secured from gupta. And inshallah, we will do what is gupta, there's a difference between uh, what is hasad and what is hupta, then the cure for jealousy, the causes of jealousy, and between jealousy and miserliness. So that's chapter two. Um, because that's one of the diseases of the heart. So one, so he, what he's, he's not spoken about all the diseases, but just two major ones. And I think he's focused more on hasad and on the disease of desires, uh, the shahawat. So between jealousy and desires, the reality of passionate love. Ish. The natural inclination of the heart is to love Allah. And what, how the heart is affected when somebody loves anything or anyone more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead of focusing on Allah, if someone's focus moves to some, something else, and again, that's the beginning of the disease of the heart. Uh, the, the prevention from that and the cures for the heart. And in the end, he has restriction on types of heart. So I'm going to swipe, and there are a lot of, uh, there's a huge introduction page, so I'm just going to skip all of that. Uh, the beginning, there are some of the sayings of Ibn Taymiyyah, so I'm just going to read those, and then I'll begin the topic, inshallah. Um, so the first thing that he has is, these are like quotes of Ibn Taymiyyah. Every punishment from him is pure justice, and every blessing from him is pure grace. And always remember, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually, um, you know, brings a calamity in our lives, we think that it's something bad, but sometimes it's a blessing in disguise for people. Because what happens is when Allah wants to grab your attention, or wants to pull you back to Him, closer to Him, He wants to see you making dua, He wants to see you uh, coming closer to Him, coming closer towards the deen, then when do we usually turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we turn in times of happiness, then that's amazing, that's great. But if we only turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of calamities, then that's the only way he can actually bring you close to him. Right? So that's why when Allah brings calamities, we start crying to Allah, we start making dua, we, we say, I'm going to pray more, I'm going to fast more, I'm going to do extra sadaqah to get this calamity out of my life. So the wise person will be the one who will remember Allah in times of ease as well as in times of difficulty. Because, just a second, my baby is asleep. So the wise one will be the one who will take precaution before the cure, right? Why wait for the cure? We'd rather be more precautious 
Right, one second. I'm high, there's so much of distraction here today. Sit like this. Okay. And when we look at somebody who's actually undergoing calamity, it's not necessarily bad because that is one of the ways in which Allah may be elevating this person's status in the hereafter. And because of that, he may be higher than others. Or it may be just a test from Allah to see how this person reacts, whether with sabr or whether the person, you know, moves away from the deen. So how do we know um, <clears throat> what, how, what our situation is? It depends on how we react to that certain calamity. So I think there is more of this, inshallah, towards the, in the, one of the chapters in the middle. <clears throat> so I'll do that in detail there. Um, guidance is not attained except with knowledge. And correct direction is not attained except with patience. So again, even when it comes to seeking knowledge, it's not like we just get up and you know seek knowledge and that's it. We, we just um, read for a few days or we just attend a few classes here and there. When it comes to seeking knowledge, it's a lifelong commitment because the one who seeks knowledge, Allah makes his way to Jannah easy, right? And without knowledge, your heart literally dies. Like if you see, you can, you can see it from your own experience in your own life where when there are times where when you're seeking knowledge, you automatically feel your iman being refreshed, increased, and you want to do more good. But when you keep yourself away from seeking knowledge, or if you're far away from the uh, deen, you, you, are, you can see the connection. When you don't seek knowledge, your iman goes down, and you don't do as much of good deeds as you would do before, while you would seek knowledge. And again, for us to gain knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to be in a state of obedience to him because the sin is what prevents knowledge from reaching us and this is one of the consequences of sin which Ibn al-Qayyum mentions about how sins become a barrier or they prevent beneficial knowledge from reaching us and this is one of the greatest calamity a person can face because if you don't if your sins are blocking you from doing from seeking knowledge then it's indirectly blocking you from doing more good in order to increase your rank in the hereafter then the next one, the one who is truly imprisoned is the one whose heart is imprisoned from Allah and the captivated one is the one whose desires have enslaved him. Again, when it comes to desires, what is it that takes us away from Allah? It's not necessarily always something haram. It could also be something halal and that could come in the form of desires. Desires for more, greed or desires for more of worldly gains, be it in whatever state of life you're in, whatever circumstance you're in, it could be you're a mother, so your kids become a, you know, if it's not for you, or you could be a student and your exams or whatever you're doing, your, whatever you're involved in, if it overtakes, like if you get obsessed with something in life and it dis distances you from Allah, like distracts you from worship, it keeps you away from uh, what you should have been doing, and then that becomes a fitna for us, it becomes a calamity for us because now we're not focusing on what we should be focusing and rather the desires have enslaved this person. So the, the sound heart is the one that will focus on the hereafter, that will uh, expect to work more hard in achieving, in doing things that will take the person closer to Allah and in getting a higher rank in the hereafter. Um, this whole religion revolves around knowing the truth and acting by it. And action must be accompanied by patience. So again, when it's not just about seeking knowledge, but also acting upon the knowledge. Because now we have so many people, they have so much knowledge and there, there are so many avenues of learning, right? We have all these online classes, we have YouTube videos, we have so many reminders on WhatsApp. So everybody has it, everybody knows it. So now what, what distinguishes one person from another? It's the action. So you might be knowing a lot of hadith, you might be knowing a lot of stuff. Oh yeah, I know this, I've heard this, I've done this. But is just knowing going to benefit you in any way? It has to be that the difference will be the person who's acting upon the knowledge that he has gained. And once you act upon it, then Allah may bless you with even more and more and more. And not just that, but even asking Allah, like why, by just saying, Rabbi Zidni Alma, that oh, Allah increase me in my knowledge. And then also asking Allah to help us act upon that knowledge. Allahumma ni asaluka, what's that dua? Allahumma ni asaluka, ilman nafiya wa rizqan tayyiba wa amalan mutakabbala. So that's one of the duas in which we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a beneficial knowledge. Um, there are a lot of saints. I'm just skipping a few. If you do not taste the sweetness of an action in your heart, suspect it. For the Lord exalted is He, the appreciative. 
So again, here it's about doing a good deed and then expecting, you know, the sweetness of Iman, where when you, you automatically feel close to Allah when you do certain deeds. And this only come, comes with consistency. Like if somebody is consistent, then it's like, it's like slowly building a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more the servant loves his master, the less will he love other objects and they will decrease in number. The less the servant loves his master, the more he will love other objects and they will increase in number. So the more you focus on Allah, automatically worldly desires will just leave your heart. And this is like this, this can happen even with, with a split of a second. Like For example, a person is worried. Something is, uh, you know, um, stressing a person out or you're grieving about something and you're like, it's eating you up, literally. The stress is eating you up. But the minute you think about Allah and the minute you think about the hereafter and the minute you like actually focus on what your real purpose in life should be and where you're heading, automatically everything just disappears. And this will only happen to the heart that is sound. Because the phases will come and go. You, you'll have ups and downs in your iman. You will have ups and downs in your happiness, in your joy and sorrow. But the, 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 the tension or the stress will leave you only if you have this sound heart, which when it remembers Allah, you find ease, right? So the minute you think about Allah, the minute you think about everything is going to pass by and eventually we are going to be resurrected for the hereafter. So when you think about these things and when you believe in this with yaqeen, that's when you know, the stress leaves you. So the next one. Perpetually is the servant either the recipient of a blessing from Allah in which case he is in need of gratitude or he is the perpetrator of a sin in which case he is in need of repentance. He is always moving from one blessing to another and is always in need of repentance. So again, as I mentioned before, that when sins cause calamities in our life or they block our du'as from being answered or they block beneficial knowledge from reaching us, what is the solution to that? Because we are going to be in a state of sin. Every son of Adam sins, but the best of them are those who repent. So the solution to that is repentance. So either you're receiving a blessing from Allah and you are in a state of shukr or you are sinning and you have to be in a state of repentance. So every son of Adam is in one of these two conditions. So when you're blessed by Allah, we thank Allah. And when we thank Allah, our blessings increase. And we have an entire um, lecture on shukr, which we've done in the past, where we've discussed about how when we, when we are grateful to Allah, how Allah will put barakah in our lives, just even for that one single blessing. Like if, you're, if you're grateful for something, Allah will increase it. Because we know that Allah says that, and if you are grateful, then I will give you more or I will increase it for you. So one of the ways in which we preserve our blessings is by showing gratitude to Allah. Because when we are in, or when we're ungrateful or we show ingratitude to Allah, that it could be a means of us losing that blessing. So for example, there's somebody who's blessed with a good life, good health, um, you know, a good family, and they're still complaining and nagging and crying and being like literally being ungrateful. Then Allah will just take it away. And then you'll realize the value of those blessings after they're taken away. So one of the one of the most important things I heard there's a dua Allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husna ibadika. That oh Allah, help me remember you, be grateful to you, and worship you with ihsan, with excellence. So if we are grateful, so and this dua was actually uh, advised to Mu'ad uh, by the Prophet وسلم, after every salah. So at the end of the shahud, some of the scholars say at the end of the shahud is to be recited when you finish your shahud in, the, in your salah. You have to say this, Allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husna ibadika. And this, there can be nothing better than this. Because imagine you're asking Allah to, that you remember him all the time. So that means you're asking Allah to make dhikr easy for you. And you're asking Allah to make you grateful to him. So that's, again, that's like increasing all your blessings in life by just being grateful to Allah. And the third thing you're asking is, oh Allah, make me worship you with excellence. And that's what our purpose in life is. It's a very comprehensive, brief, short dua. But the effect or the, you know, it's like being eloquent in making your duas. This is one of the eloquent duas where everything is included in just these three sentences. Okay, the next one. Sins cause harm and repentance removes the cause. So again, this is another saying of his, and we already discussed this, where if we are in a state, and when, when we say about, when we speak about repentance, what does it mean? It means that you think about it. Think about all your sins right now. 
what is the sins, what are the sins that I'm involved in? Sometimes we know we're aware of them and sometimes we're not aware of them. The question is, have we really repented from them? Have we sincerely turned to Allah and seek His forgiveness? So this has to be done on a, on a daily basis. Sometimes when we forget to repent or we just deliberately ignore the sins and we think it's not a big deal, that's when calamities strike. Because now it's Allah. And then again, there's a blessing in that because Allah wants to remind you about what we're doing. Like sometimes you're doing something haram and then Allah wants to show you or remind you that you need to repent from this or else this is going to go on in your life, whatever the situation may be. So asking Allah to first of all make us recognize what our sins are. That's another, that's another blessing, just to be aware of what our sins are. And it's different for different people. For some people, they could be dealing with bigger issues like missing salah or not wearing hijab or you know, not being um, good in your character to others and stuff like that. And for some, it could be minor things which may not even be considered as sins for others. So it really varies from person to person, from a person's iman, varies from a person's level of knowledge. But each one knows where their shortcomings are. And Allah knows who is... Uh, sincere and who is not sincere so it's, it's all between you and Allah and the other thing that actually makes the heart dead is living for the sake of pleasing people and this is a huge calamity where everybody today is just living for the sake of impressing XYZ or just their friends or their colleagues and it's all with this whole social media thing of you know portraying a fake life just to please people whereas Allah is like you know completely ignored in the entire picture Whereas if you actually make Allah the center of your life, it really won't matter what people think. And then it becomes easier to practice your deen also. Because sometimes people withhold practicing their religion to the best of their ability because of thinking what people will think. And sometimes people actually do righteous deeds also just to impress people. So both ways we're losing. Either we're getting into haram because of people or we're doing the good but to impress people, which comes in the topic of Riyah. And again, we have a huge full session on sincerity in one of those uh, lectures that we've done before about how your complete um, deed can be wasted just with the wrong intention or just because of Riyah. You might be doing so much good and if you don't have the intention of pleasing Allah or if you do it for the sake of either you will lose the reward which is you don't make the intention for doing it for the sake of Allah or you just end up adding more sin to yourself by getting, falling into the category of Riyah. So when we're doing any action, it could be anything, anything that you're doing. Like even in your home, you could be just basically cooking food. And if you make the intention that I'm doing this for the sake of Allah to feed my family, you've got the reward. And if you just do it, you know, routinely, then it could just be a lost reward. Similarly, Salah, when we stand up for Salah, is, is our Salah really for the sake of Allah? Or are we just doing it as a ritual? It's become a routine for us. So that's how when we gain knowledge, when we refresh our Iman, it has a huge impact on all of our actions because now the intention changes and you can magnify your reward by magnifying your intention. So if you, it could be a tiny, small good deed, but because you made the intention pure and for the sake of Allah, then that becomes heavy on your scale on the day of judgment. So repenting from sins, thinking about the sins, turning away from them and turning to Allah sincerely and automatically you will see the effect. And that is why we need to focus on the mercy of Allah. He's a Rahman. He's willing to call, he's willing to accept you anytime, anyhow, as long as you're sincere and you don't commit shirk. Allah is willing to forgive all of your sins. That's how merciful Allah is. And we have to believe in that. That when we believe in that, it becomes easy that no matter what you've done, no matter what situation you're in, if you just turn to Allah, do istighfar, and make the intention of not going back to that sin, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins and make it easy for you. Um, bearing witness to Tawheed opens the door of good and repentance from sins closes the door of evil. Um, a man will never fear something besides Allah unless it is due to a disease in his heart. So again, if we are, um, you know, we don't do certain things because we fear what he will say, what she will say, or should I do this, should I not do this? If we are fearing people, then there is something in the heart that is not right. Because what is Tawheed? La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Right? That there is that um, there is no might or power except with Allah. Right? La ilaha illallah. That there is no God but Allah. There is no one worthy of worship but Allah. There's no one worthy of obedience except Allah. Right? So if this is strong in our heart, that everything revolves around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of everything. He is the center of our lives. So if this is clear in our hearts, then automatically you know, we will be living our lives. It's like, you know, um, directing a compass and automatically just following those directions. 
So if Allah is the center of our life and if we are firm upon this Tawheed, and that's why it's extremely important to learn Aqidah. You know, why is it that, you know, um, the scholars always stress that if you really want to start learning a religion, then start with Aqidah. Because that is the foundation of belief. That's the foundation of your entire, um, you know, hereafter depends on what is your Aqidah, what is your belief. And if we have sound Aqidah, you know, everything, you will never ever worry about what people think or say because now you know who Allah is by knowing what our Aqidah is, what our belief is, what Tawheed is. And once we know what um, Tawheed is automatically, um, your, you know, whatever you feared will disappear. Whatever you stopped yourself from doing because of the fear of people or because of, you know, living for others. Now you know that Allah is the center of our life. So automatically all your actions will become pure and for the sake of Allah. Uh, trials and tribulations are like feeling the heat and cold. When one knows that they cannot be avoided, he will not feel anger at their onset, nor will he be distressed or disheartened. And again, trials and tribulations, they depend on the state of your heart. If somebody is in a complete you know, state of sound heart, then even if it's a calamity, that person won't grieve over it or blame Allah for it or not understand why it's happening. So when Allah gives us that hikmah or that wisdom to see the trial with a different angle. Like for example, a person may be suffering from the outside. For the other people, it looks like a punishment or it looks like a huge calamity. But for that person, even though he's going through that thing, it could be completely different. He must be living in a different world because he looks at it as a blessing from Allah. Or he looks at it as a means of getting closer to Allah. Or Allah puts that wisdom in him to understand why this is happening in his or her life. So the next quote, the perfection of Tawheed is found when there remains nothing in the heart except Allah. The servant is left loving those he loves and what he loves, hating those he hates and what he hates, showing allegiance to those he has allegiance to and showing enmity to those he has enmity towards, ordering that which he orders and prohibiting what he prohibits. So basically when the perfection of Tawheed is found in your heart. What happens is you begin to love what Allah loves. You begin to hate what Allah hates. You begin to order what he orders or commands. And you begin to prohibit what he prohibits. So, um, again, you know the, the hadith where my slave draws not close to me. Except with that which I've made obligatory upon him. And he keeps drawing closer to me with um, the voluntary acts until I become... I'm just I'm paraphrasing the hadith. I don't have it here. Until I become the eye with which he sees, the ear with which he hears, and so on. And the hadith goes on. So what, it, what, what does it say? That the best way to draw close to Allah subhanahu wa is through the obligation. And again, it's an extremely important point because what happens is people, sometimes the shaitan misguides us and takes us towards uh, doing the voluntary or something which is extra, extra or not, which is not... Um, you know, necessary at that moment at the cost of your obligations. For example, a person is waking up for the hajjud but not praying fajr, right? Or a person is doing something which is voluntary but at the cost of their obligations. So if you really want to, that, that does not mean that you don't do the voluntary. What it means is that you perfect your obligations and that's, that's very important, like especially with the roles in our life. What is your role in your life at the current moment? I need to like change the room and go to another room just a second. Okay, carry all this stuff. Um, yes, so doing your obligatory, what, what Allah has uh, made obligatory for you at the moment. For example, if you're a mother, then your obligation is towards your family, towards your kids, and not in something extra, which you may be doing outside thinking that you're doing it for good, but in reality, it becomes. Um, it becomes a means of distraction for you from what Allah made obligatory upon you, right? So <clears throat> knowing what is obligatory upon me, and it comes in terms of either ibadah or in terms of your um, you know, daily life, your basic duties. Like for example, or being, obligatory, or being dutiful to your parents at the cost of doing something like there are, there are some you know, young people who volunteer outside and they're helping out in the massages and all of that. When it comes to being uh, helpful in the home to their parents or to their spouses or to any other uh, you know, calamity or any other um, duty in the house and they are negligent in that. So again, that's what the Prophet said, that the best of you are those who are best to their families. 
Why? Because that's where the real test lies. And that's also because uh, when you're outside, it's very easy to impress people. It's very easy to have a different face outside and to show that I'm all good and stuff. But when it comes to your family, you, you don't really care because they're not going to pat your back, right? So you, like the, the man is really created in a way that where he wants to receive compliments, he wants to show others. But somebody who's sincere will not really care about these things because what their focus is, whether Allah is pleased with me or not, so whether I do it here or whether I do it there, it doesn't really make a difference if I know that what I'm doing is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, you know, correcting our intentions, living for the sake of Allah and whatever we do, it has to be done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or else the deed is not even going to be counted. So when the heart is diseased, when the heart is away from Allah, all of these um, actions, they kind of become a means of deceiving us. And that's what shaitan does. He makes you think that you're doing something good and then you, you know, you end up, you end up yourself thinking that this is something good that I'm doing. But in reality, it could be that all of this is just a waste and a means of deception from shaitan. The next one. Sins are like chains and locks preventing their perpetrator from roaming in the vast garden of Tawheed and reaping the fruits of righteous actions. So again, the sins are the things that prevent us from doing good, from doing righteous actions. And they also prevent us from understanding Tawheed at times. So again, if you really want to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want to get close to him, the, the, the first way is to repent. To repent and to stop committing the sins we're committing and thinking about um, the reward of leaving those sins. Because imagine, it's, sometimes it's difficult for people to <clears throat> turn to Allah and stop sinning because they feel they're going to lose out on life. But who is the source of happiness? It's Allah. Who is the source? Who is the provider in our life? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we are doing something to please him or when we're giving up something for the sake of Allah, it will never, ever, ever, you know, go to waste. Because Allah has the ability to reward us much more than we can think. So you might give up something small for the sake of Allah, but the way he rewards you, maybe you, you cannot even, you won't even ever contemplate that you got so much in life or, you, you know, your hereafter was... Um, your rank in the hereafter was drastically increased just because of something small that you sacrificed for the sake of Allah or something small that you did purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the last one is the famous saying of Ibn Taymiyyah. I think we will end the session with that. What can my enemies do to me? I have in my chest both my heaven and my garden. If I travel, they are with me, never leaving me. Imprisonment, imprisonment for me is a chance to be alone with my Lord to be killed is martyrdom and to be exiled from my land is a spiritual journey, meaning hijrah. So <clears throat> what this actually means is that if your heart is sound, like, you know, if, if the, like what he's saying is that what can anybody do to me? What can my enemies do to me if my garden and my Jannah is in my heart? Meaning you're, you're completely in a state of tranquility and no matter what is happening outside, it doesn't really affect you because your heart is sound. Right? And sometimes you have people who have everything in life and yet they're not happy on the inside. Because remember that happiness is not connected to materialistic things. It can never be connected to materialistic things. It can only, only, only come through Allah SWT. It can only come from Allah. So when our, and, Allah can, and Allah will only give it to the ones who have a sound heart. So when you have a sound heart, which is in connection with Allah, like on the outside it might look all fake and it's very easy to fake all of these things. It's very easy for to laugh in front of people and to show that you're happy or, you know, when we see, uh, you know, sometimes people look up to celebrities and people look up to whoever you may be surrounded with or whatever you look up to. It's very easy, especially in the world of social media, to show people one side, but the reality which is inside, only Allah SWT knows and only that person knows. So when, uh, the one who has a sound heart, uh, sometimes on the outside it might look like, oh, this poor guy, he's suffering or he's so poor or this and that but he may be the most happiest person on the inside right because he may be healthy he may be sleeping well he may be having um you know time for the deen reading the quran reading the salah on time working for the hereafter and allah puts you know that peace in the person's heart and these phases will come and go sometimes your heart is at ease and sometimes your heart is restless so again it depends on which phase of life we're in nobody's going to have complete happiness and contentment in this life because that's for jannah right so when we are in the of in the in the phase of happiness we show gratitude to Allah and when we're in a phase of struggle we have sabr it's like all about sabr and shukr and also when we're in a state of struggle we make repentance we keep turning to Allah and we just have that patience to gain the reward because if you don't have patience at that moment or if we complain at that moment 
that's when we lose the reward, the reward of patience. Um, okay, so that's the end of the quotes. The next part is about his works, his death, and then the first chapter begins. So, oh yeah, and I've posted on the screen the introduction part, but I don't think I want to start this now because if I start this now, then it's going to be done halfway and it's already 30 minutes are over. So Ishara, we will continue from the next page in the next session. If you have any questions, you can post it in the chat session right now. <laughs> Getting a bit cranky. What does it mean? If a person is just praying because somebody is asking them to pray, for example, if there is, um, if uh, you're praying just because somebody's ordering you to pray, right? So you're just doing it for the sake of getting done with the prayer. That is one thing. But the other thing, sometimes you enter the masjid and you usually don't, like somebody doesn't pray, pray usually, but now they're praying because they're surrounded with their friends, which is still okay. You still have to pray because you have to lift the obligation from yourself, right? You have to um, uh, complete the obligation which Allah has put on you. So that doesn't mean that if you're in front of people, you don't pray. You still pray and you still fight that intention of doing it for the sake of Allah. For example, on our, day, in our daily lives, if we are praying, uh, we just get up and it's become a ritual. Like we just go, we do, we do, we just pray because we have to get done with it. That is one thing. So what we've done is we've lifted the obligation of Salah from ourselves, right? Meaning we've obeyed Allah. He's asked us to pray, we've prayed. But now when we were praying, was that how was the quality of the salah? That's the question. Like, uh, like when we make the intention, like I'm like the, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, and because I want to reap the rewards or the benefits from the salah. So you could have two people. But that one person is just you know, wudu pray up down up down up down and done. So I'm done with my salah. So it's like you know, literally lifting off a burden of yourself, treating the salah in that fashion. And the other would be the person who actually prays with tranquility and peace. And is and it's, you, you'll never reach a state of perfection, but you're at least struggling and trying to put as much attention as you can because your salah is literally like having um, a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allah responds by saying, my servant has praised me. And you, while you are giving attention to Allah in your salah, Allah is attentive towards you. The minute you turn away, that's when Allah will turn away. So when you read the tafsir of Surah Fatiha, all of this is explained about how when we're saying Surah Fatiha, it's actually uh, Allah responds after every verse when we recite. Now, how many of us actually pray our salah on a daily basis thinking about this tafsir or thinking about this whole conversation that's happening between you and Allah? Right? So next time when you stand before Allah in your salah, it has to be done with khushu, with humility, with, uh, with the knowledge or being conscious that I'm standing before Allah and Allah is listening to me. Allah is aware that I'm, so we say Sami Allah liman hamida, right? We keep saying, like, if we know the meanings of what we are saying in our salah, then it becomes more easy to have khushu in the salah. And you will see that when you pray uh, with khushu and with, you know, tranquility and peace, you will see the difference immediately after salah. Because what does the salah do? It keeps us away from fahisha, it keeps us away from sins. And how will this happen? Only if we've prayed the salah, if we've prayed the salah correctly. Whereas if we're just praying because everybody's praying and because we've grown up doing it, like for example, there are sisters who pray but they don't cover their aura properly, meaning their ankles are showing or their um, arms are showing, their hair is showing from the back or front or, you know, they're not, you, the, the first thing that a woman should actually take care of while praying salah is her dress. Like you have to have a separate outfit for salah, meaning, you know, those gowns that come, that's the best thing, whatever works best for you, but there are special salah gowns that come with, you just throw it over your head and it reaches the floor. So it covers you completely. Yeah, like your arms and your feet and uh, everything from your, you know, the back and everything. Because, you know, in the, in the, in the Indo-Pakistani culture, people usually pray in their salwar kameez with the dupatta just wrapped around their heads and the forearms are all open. But when you're doing Allahu Akbar, the dupatta is gone behind. So your arms are seen. When you go in the ruku, something else is seen. So your salah becomes invalid. And this is very important. You have to know what is it that is 